Hello, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? They haven't been heard in over four years. They're raw. It took me a while to develop a style. A lot of people like them that way, unvarnished. Others commented that it was amateurish. Nonetheless, here they are, unedited. I haven't gone back and listened to them. I haven't cleaned them up. Thanks for listening. And once again, life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Hey, welcome to the podcast. This is Who Killed Teresa, and I'm your host, John Allure. And this is a podcast where we discuss a series of unsolved uh, murders and missing ca- uh, missing persons cases um, in the Quebec region of the Eastern Townships and, and Montreal uh, in the era of approximately between 1975 and 1981. And um, if you're just joining us, try to hang in there. But if you're picking up uh, some of the loose ends, uh, I think this is going to be um, a recap episode. We had a series of interviews uh, with uh, Michael Arnfield and uh, Kim Rosmo, and I kind of want to touch on those, as well as tie up a few loose ends with the Catherine Hawks um, case that we discussed in three episodes back. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. This is um, could be the briefest episode um, ever. Although um, when we're finished with those things, I do would like to add another case uh, if I have time. This also could be the longest episode either, um, ever as well. And, and it could be one where I'm um, particularly bumbling my way along. So um, uh, that, that might be really frustrating. And I apologize in advance. But I got a lot of ideas, a lot of loose ends that I, I kind of want to mop all up, um, collectively summarize, and then we can move forward with, um, with where we are with, I think, what we've, we've covered seven or eight of these uh, unsolved murders so far, and we still have um, a lot to add to the list. So with that, I, I, I want to touch back on the Catherine Hawks case. Um, if you recall, Catherine Hawks was um, the uh, one of the cases uh, for, that, that occurred on, on the island of Montreal. We are, were pr- predominantly in the beginning dealing with cases in the eastern townships and then slowly moved over to Chambly and uh, saint jean sur richelieu And then we crept in with the Sharon Pryor case uh, um, to uh, Pointe-Saint-Charles, uh, with the body being discovered in Longuier. Um, and then, of course, we, we also had the Les Amblais, that which was a murder in the east end of Montreal. But Catherine Hawks, if you recall, this is the case. She was the oldest victim, um, and she was... Uh, Traveling home uh, one uh, afternoon, she she normally took um, the electric train home on her commute, but there was a power outage that night, so she couldn't take the train. She had to take the bus. So she gets off um, at the bus stop, which is just at the Cartierville uh, train station, um, in uh, just along the north end of Montreal, and proceeds to walk to her apartment somewhere between her her apartment and uh, the bus stop. She's attacked just adjacent to where that Cartierville train station is. Um, She's presumably dragged into the bushes. She's beaten. She's strangled. She's raped. Um, And so so that's the, and of course, no one is caught again. Um, But something I left out, I, I believe I left this out, and it's really important, and it has to do with Catherine's shoes, Now, we've had a lot of mention of peculiarities with shoes um, in these cases. In the case of Catherine, what's curious about it is Catherine would have been walking um, like south to north um, from the bus station, bus stop to her residence. And if you recall, she's, she's attacked at the south end of the train tracks body is disposed in in that area some of her clothing is found there but her shoes go missing 
and they're not re recovered until several weeks later. A, a woman sees them in some underbrush next to a sidewalk. But curiously, where she sees them is just north of where she was attacked. And, and in, if you're trying to get the geography, if, if she's walking south to north along the sidewalk, attacked in the bushes, south end of the tracks, and then the shoes are found either, depending on how you traverse the geography, crossing on foot over the tracks or crossing on foot on the sidewalk in the underpass, the, 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 the vehicle underpass with the sidewalk under the tracks, which means that the assailant would have had to presumably attacked Catherine, killed her, taken her shoes, walked over or under the train tracks, and then made the decision to throw them into the bushes. And then, of course, we know much later, make two phone calls into the police to say that Catherine's body is there. Police never respond until approximately 22 hours later. Um, if anybody out there can figure out what this is, uh, why someone would travel with shoes, and then at a later point, arbitrarily decide to dispose of them. I suppose the other alternative is to say that Catherine is actually attacked on the north end of the tracks. Her shoes come off. I don't know. She's chased. She's carried to the point where she was found. Uh, pretty risky behavior. Um, that that uh, over the tracks is more secluded. Under the tracks, there's all kinds of traffic going through there, pedestrian or vehicular. Um, it's it's a, a detail that I I thought was very, very important, and just by chance I left it out. I should have put it in the, the episode so we'd have a complete picture there, but I didn't. I forgot. Um, a couple other loose ends with that uh, Catherine Hawks case I wanted to uh, clear up. Um, um, uh, uh, a um, reporter with the CBC uh, radio um, wrote afterwards to inform me of two things, two things that I, I got wrong. One was I mentioned that a couple of boys smelt what appeared to be the odor of the decaying body and went into the bushes and found Catherine Hawks. That, that's not what happened. What they smelled was a very pungent flower in the area. And then they went into the bushes and I'm not really sure why they wanted to investigate a pungent flower. Uh, my tendency would be to avoid it. But nevertheless, they did. They went into the bushes, they discovered the body. So I, I got that wrong. Second thing is she wanted to clarify. I, I, anecdotally, I mentioned um, the former premier of Quebec, uh, René Lévesque, and, and mentioned the, the, the irony that he ran over a transient on what later became uh, René Lévesque Boulevard. Dorchester was later named after René's uh, uh, death uh, um, in his name. Apparently that's not true. I, I got the name wrong. That accident actually occurred on Côte de Neige in Montreal. So I was trying to give a little too much poet, poetic irony to it. I got it wrong. I think long and short of it is it's kind of nice to have a, um, somebody from CBC Radio actually listening to the podcast and, and acting as your kind of de facto uh, editor. I'll take that. It's fine by me. And then a couple of other things I, I thought might be interesting uh, to address concerning the, the Rosmo interview and the, the uh, Artfield um, interview. Uh, to begin with, with Rosmo, um, I, 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 when, when these interviews were over, I, I realized that I think in an earlier podcast, I had committed to the idea that I would, you know, this was not a podcast where I discussed uh, celebrity serial killers, you know, like uh, Charles Manson or, or or the Green River Killer, and then bang, right out of the gate, <laughs> what did we discuss in both episodes? The Zodiac. Um, I think we also touched on Green River. We also, um, uh, at some point, well, with Christian Gravner, uh, we certainly touched on Charles Man Manson. Uh, uh, my bad. I, I, <laughs> I felt I felt like a huge hypocrite for that, but it's going to come up. Uh, uh, b both Kim and, and, and Mike had, uh, I thought, very insightful things to say about those cases. And sometimes they're very, very useful um, to bring up because they bear reference 
you know, everybody knows those cases. Nobody knows these Quebec cases. They help shine some light on um, instances of behavior or victimology or modus operandi. So um, I may discuss celebrity cases in the future. Um, um, don't hold me to any rules. I'm making this up as I, as I go along. Um, I also, um, I, I neglected, I wanted at some point to talk to Kim about the fact that he worked on the Beltway, Beltway sniper cases in Washington that ha happened uh, shortly after 9-11 um, uh, when those, those series of sniper um, cases occurred. He helped the, the Washington and, and Virginia and Maryland uh, police use uh, geographic profiling uh, to eventually uh, catch um, uh, it's, it's Lee Melvo, I believe is his name, and his his associate, um, the juvenile. Uh, we didn't get to that. We sort of ran out of time. Um, I also wanted to mention anecdotally, you know, when, uh, when W5 did that radio program, or excuse me, television program on, on my sister, investigative journalism show, like kind of like, you know, NBC Investigates or those kind of shows. W5 is a, is a Canadian equivalent of that, you know, these investigative shows. And they did an hour on Teresa. And they, for a portion of that, they, um, they, they flew down to Texas to interview Kim. Um, and they, apparently they interviewed him in his house. And I just remember asking one of the producers, oh, what was that like? And they said, you know, it was really interesting because um, Kim's house was the you know, it was neat as a pin, it, with, with nothing out of place, very Spartan. Um, it's it's like he's he's clearly a a criminologist who just lives in this element. They were like, there's there was probably not a speck of of DNA anywhere in that household. It was sort of like Gattaca, you know, <laughs> that that kind of sci-fi environment or something, which. I found amusing. Kind of want to ask him about neglected to do it. There you go. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to touch on this point. You know, I, I was trying to clearly drive uh, Kim and Mike in into an opinion on, quite frankly, am I pushing things too far? You get it. I, I keep bringing this up. Um, are potentially 20 cases connected within a hundred mile radius um, over five or six years. And Kim's comment was something like, you know, the, the further you get away from that space and time, the more the probability falls apart. I think he said something to the effect of, I'd feel more comfortable with two miles within 60 days. Kim is, is clearly the king on this and he's, he's, the consummate criminologist. I am not a criminologist, and I can be much more cavalier in my opinion because I'm I'm just the victim's brother, um, and I'm obviously, as, as I said before, you, you know, I'm, I'm going for hail mary passes here. I'm kind of trying to throw anything against the wall at this point and see what sticks. Um, because clearly, we've you know, after with many of these cases, we're approaching. 40 years uh, unsolved, if, if not over 40 years in some cases. But I would just like to point out his two miles and 60 days does contradict his profile that he originally did on Teresa Lore, Menons Bay, um, uh, Louise Cameron, when he gave a very, very professional opinion that said that these cases may be connected and should be investigated as a series and that a ser serial killer was probably living um, in the south end of Sherbrooke at that time. Well, when he gave that opinion, he was talking about th a 30 mile ra radius when you consider the locations of all the disappearances and, and, and dump size, sites and a 17 month timeline. So two miles, 60 days, 30 miles, 17 months. I just wanted to put that out there. And then again, you know, I, I did try to drive Mike Artenfield into the same conclusion, and he was very careful too. These guys are, 
professional academics with with uh, reputations to maintain in their field, those being cavalier about uh, opinions like that could really come back to haunt them. They're always going to err on the side of uh, caution. I am always going to push the envelope, frankly. Um, and that's the way it is. Um, some other things I wanted to mention. Uh, something I keep forgetting. <clears throat> Recall in the in the Sharon Pryor case, again, Sharon Pryor was the 16-year-old uh, victim from Point Saint-Charles who turned up brutally beaten, uh, strangled, um, raped in Longueuil, uh, Quebec. And recall that she was found in this rural area where uh, there were bees were keeping. It, it was an, an apiary. What I, I did want to bring up, and it, it may be nothing, but might as well throw it out on the table since we're throwing everything out on the table at this point. The the location where Louise Cameron was found, where the possibility of the purse for Lisa Blay was found, where the clothing matching the description of clothing my sister was last wearing was cited by two hunters. Recall that's Chemin Guerre, uh, just south of the town of Magog, adjacent to Lake Menfer Magog. I drove through there in mm, 2003, and there was there was a beekeeping facility uh, just on Chemin Guerre, the um, the south side of that road, the opposite side of where um, all the activity occurred. And and one other thing I'd like to to mention about bees, I, I forget. So. Um, uh, Stéphane Perrin, the, uh, the realist, his director in, in Quebec, who's working on this Quebec film, uh, Cette Femme. His previous film was called uh, Novembre 84, uh, 80, uh, 80, uh, 80, uh, Boy, my French is going really bad. Um, so November 84, it's about a series of child murders in, in the Montreal region. And one of those young boys was found near an apiary. I forget which one, um, and I, I'm not going to research it. If, if somebody out there remembers, just shoot me a line or something and we'll clarify that. But those are three, you know, three geographic locations, uh, with, uh, with beekeeping facilities, that's curious. I realize now I'm, I'm I'm pushing outside my my limit of 81 into 84 cases, but you know that's okay. It, uh, we can restructure and 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 reframe things when we want to, and and then realize when we want to that maybe that reframing was a little ridiculous. Um, other other things. Oh oh yeah, I told you I was going to bumble my way through this, and I already have. Back to Catherine Hawks, um, the, 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 we certainly on that episode mentioned the, the gross negligence and criminal investigative failure on the part of the Montreal police, and, and that's the second time we've addressed the Montreal police. Les Anglais was also a MUC case, um, and the problem with, with recall in the in the Catherine Hawks' cases, even though they were notified at 10 in the evening that there was a woman dying in the bushes, they waited a full 22 hours in, before they eventually went out to that site and found the body. And Catherine was clearly alive um, when the anonymous call was made because the person... Number one, because the person who made the call said she was alive. Number two, because the autopsy revealed that she didn't just die from her wounds, she died from exposure to the elements. It was a cold and windy night. And and that the the Montreal police should be held a, 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 accountable for the gross negligence in that case even though it's from 1977, 1978. Um, 
funnily enough, the, the, the day that I posted that, the very next morning the, in the Montreal papers, the, the headline read, Quebec calls inquiry into systemic problems in Montreal police service. So this inquiry is coming directly from the, um, the Minister of Public Security, uh, Martin uh, Quatieux, and he's the one who called uh, what was, has been going on recently with the Montreal police as systemic failures. At its um, focus, what it has to do is with two whistleblowers in the agency who tried to come forward with information and immediately uh, the MUC closed ranks and, and planted false evidence um, against them in order to discredit their whistleblowing claims. This is at its root. Now from this, uh, people in Quebec, understandably, I mean, this happened two or three weeks ago, are in an uproar. Uh, a lot of people very, very anxious and, and wanting to know. There's, there's a lot of confusion about how far back their, their mandate goes which of the divisions they're actually investigating, um, who's investigating them. Um, by last account, originally who was going to investigate them was the Sarté de Québec, the provincial police, and that's never good. The fox guarding the hen house, as far as I'm concerned, um, given the criminal negligence with the SQE, SQ that I've witnessed over the years. They then expanded that to say that it's the, the, the corruption with the Montreal police is so vast that they've enlisted the um, assistance of, I believe it's the Gatineau police, which is a force north of Ottawa, the uh, Longuet police, and the RCMP. Well, of course, as we've already discussed on this podcast, the problems with Longuet, again, they're, they're, they're even, uh, they're as ineffective as the MUC and the, the Sarté de Québec, and have, as we've also discussed, one of the uh, lowest clearance rate for homicide in uh, at least the 30-year period from 76 to 2005, because we have that from a StatsCan report, um, if not longer. Right now, we're, I'm, I'm trying to get updated data from StatsCan that's the federal agency that keeps statistics for Canada, updated information um, from them on the 2005 period to 2000, let's say 16, the year that just closed. So how are we doing? Are we moving, are we moving the needle? Are these agencies getting at any better at homicides clearance? Um, last I, I heard from uh, uh, StatsCan, uh, through an associate who's working with me on this, is uh, they said they can't give us agency information. I don't know why not. They published a report for 30 years where we had agency information. Now they're telling us not. So we're still kind of negotiating this, finding our way through. But anyway, there is, there's now a public inquiry into them. And um, I was asked the question by several victims' families, uh, are they going to look into cold cases? So I... Um, to get some clarity on some of the confusion, I, I called uh, uh, Marc Lapin, my contact. He's the, the head of the Cold Case Bureau with the Sûreté de Québec, and, and I put it to him, to him. And he said, no, uh, they're, not, they're not looking at the investigation unit. They're just looking at the administration. And they're not going back a long time. It's not like you can cherry pick and kind of throw anything against the wall um, uh, for them. So, meaning, um, because they're not looking at um, ca uh, investigations, they wouldn't be looking at the Catherine Hawks case. And also, because they're not only, I think they're going back five years, maybe at a maximum 10 years in the agency's history. Well, that's beyond the, or that doesn't reach the limit of Catherine Hawks. So, unfortunate, we're not, we're not getting any um, satisfaction from that. Um, but there it is. Uh, more to come. We'll see. We'll see in in the, the months to come what this in, in is born out from this inquiry. Another thing I wanted to address is uh, 
it was put to me, and it's not the first time, it's been put to me a lot of times this way, that in corralling all these cases around my cause, I am somehow re-victimizing victims and selfishly, uh, those words were used, selfishly using these cases for my own mandate, for my own purposes. And I get that. Um, and I get it if it was true. But um, just for the record, I know the families of 90% of these cases. And when I say I know them, in 90% of these victims, they, they, they're my Facebook friends. So we're, we're a tight group. We don't all live in the same place, but we're tight. Um, and the most, the most recent one to join the ranks was uh, Jocelyn Houle's, a relative of Jocelyn Houle, uh, who we haven't discussed yet, but we will, contacted me with the same questions that I've been getting from all these people all, all these years, which is, you, first of all, thank you for bringing this stuff to light, which is nice. I appreciate that. But also, what can we do as a collective? Can you share the information with me? Of course I can. I will always do that. Uh, um, and sharing a similar experience with whatever agency they were dealing with at that time, which is we were always kept in the dark. We were told, you know, that things aren't connected, that nothing could be done. And then, you know, further um, up appalling uh, circumstances where evidence is destructed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not exploiting anyone. Um, and usually, you know, that's... It, that's used as a tactic to try and make me feel guilty so that I'll shut up, which is not going to happen to begin with. That's, that's, that's flat. The, the only instance where I can feel that I'm not, a, it's not that I'm exploiting someone, but that I feel sensitive about their case because I'm not quite on, they're not quite on board with it as I am, is the family of Louise Cameron. Camera is one of the earliest victims we talked about. Sherbrooke woman with the she was in the cadets, the Sherbrooke Hussars, and that sort of military training in Sherbrooke. Found brutally uh, raped and murdered, bootlace around her neck near Chemin Guerre. Now, in in Louise's case, uh, I am civil with her family. I know her sister. I certainly know her brother, uh, Bernard. Bernard and I have talked over the years. He's very cooperative. Um, but he's not as gung-ho as some of the rest of us are. He simply made the choice to turn the page and move on with his life, which I fully respect. However, I cannot untie my sister's case from the case of Louise Camara. We are inextricably linked. We are linked through the geographic profiling analysis that Kim Rosmo done, did, and we will ever forever be linked in that manner. So I can be respectful that they don't want to be involved. I wish they were involved. It would be one more family. But that's the only instance that I can think of where where you know, somebody is not on board, but I'm not pushing them to be on board in, in any way. They've asked to be left alone. I leave them alone unless I have a really important question to ask. And in all instances, when, when that has arisen, they have been extremely cooperative. You know, I often hear, we often hear it as, as a cliche that families in these instances, need closure. We don't need closure. We need justice. I won't speak for anyone else, but I find the term closure to be deeply offensive and a cliche and something someone says when they don't know what else to say. But closure to me, whenever I hear it, 
is another way of saying, will you just shut up about this stuff? What what will will allow you to no longer talk about it so we don't have to hear about it? And I'm saying, well, that's not closure. If you want me to stop talking about this, what I require is justice. And justice for me is either solving one of these crimes hmm, or bringing the police agencies who through malfeasance or ineptitude or plain carelessness or uh, inadequacies in training, I don't care what it is, bringing them, holding them accountable. That in itself would be a sense of justice. And that's purely flat what I'm looking for. Moving on to some other things. Uh, so Michael um, Arnfield, I, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as, as I did. Uh, My, Michael and I serendipitously just kind of met up and it just clicked somehow. Uh, he's, he's got a lot that really interests me, not, not least of which is this idea that he, he's a PhD who teaches a course in criminology and literature. My, my undergraduate degree is in English literature, so immediately I, I was hooked to this, his ideas around this. And, and I asked him about this, and I said, I, I said, I think if I understand what you're saying is the field of serial profiling is um, 40 to at max 50 years old. It's really still really, really young. It started with uh, FBI agent Robert Reisler. Um, in the early 70s and his foundation work with, with John Wayne Gacy and some of those early cases. Um, but criminology is timeless. So what he says is, you know, rather than going back and looking at these old dusty case studies on mental illness and looking at the same information that everybody has been pouring over, uh, recent literature on cr criminology and and uh, offenders perhaps the antecedents can be found in in fiction and this is this is fascinating because um, art imitates life life Im imitates art but art imitates life so there is in anything that is uh, fictively written there is a truth behind it um, Shakespeare's works encompass the the entire 360 degrees of humanity from from virtue to villainy look into this stuff and uh, so one of the things he he recommends in his in his first book uh, murder city is uh, a re um, analysis of the early detective fiction of Edgar Allan Poe who is is by most accounts is considered the the father of detective fiction recall that his his uh, where Conan Doyle has Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe has uh, the Chevalier Auguste uh, Dupin who and his his big thing is and I find this fascinating is is that analysis does not exclusively mean mathematics mathematics and, and numbers is important in analysis, but there's all kinds of psychological elements that also come into play. And um, I was really interested by this. So I went back and I, I, I actually I had stomach flu on Monday. So I went back and I read uh, Poe's three stories that concern uh, Dupin, uh, the Purloin letter I think I read in high school, but it's been years since I reread it. The um, the murders on the Rue Morgue, which is his first, but the one I, I find most fascinating is this the second the sequel to Murders in the Rue Morgue, the mystery of uh, Marie Roger. This case is based, or this story is based 
on an actual unsolved murder of Marie Rogers from, I think it's a, right around the 1840s in New York City. A woman goes, disappears um, in New York City, um, ends up dead, I think, in the Hudson River. Jeez, you're going to have to excuse me. My cat. I knew this was going to happen. I'm blabbering away, and the cat finally <laughs> interrupts. I wanted to get this out in just one take today. I thought maybe, is this the episode where I can just do one take? Um, but cat's not going to let me to. So I'm going to pause you here for a second. Hang on. I'm going to let the cat out. All right. I'm back. Uh, cat's out. Might be back in. I don't know. So, uh, the um, mystère de... Marie Rogers, uh, Mary Mary Rogers, Marie Roger. Um, so it's it's as I said, it's it's based on an actual ca- case um, that occurred in New York City uh, around the turn of the eight, 1800s when Poe was 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 living in New York City and working as a journalist. Um, and it's unsolved. And and w- what Poe does as um, the the um, uh, Dupin character is he sort of uh, he lays out what all the newspaper accounts said at that time um, and, and I, I can only imagine I, I, I have to assume that the, the newspaper accounts that he cites in here are actual accounts from the New York papers at the time because he footnotes them all you know the New York Courier the New York Evening Post the New York Standard and then he he then kind of he has a character who's a a police officer who who comes to Dupin's house and and, and relates to him all the information that they currently know um, and 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 the frustrations they're having solving uh, Marie's murder and and I should say that Poe translates the story from New York City to Paris so instead of the Hudson River we have the Saint. Um, et cetera, et cetera. We have a we have a series of French newspapers in standing in for the New York papers, and, and then what he does when it's all over, um, Poe slash Dupin doesn't give a definitive conclusion. He he doesn't say who the murderer is because he doesn't know. He doesn't say even who he thinks the murderer is because he doesn't know. But what he does do is say, let me tell you which information is illogical and incorrect. Let me tell you which information is probable and possible. And then let me lead you to some possibilities of who this could be. Um, And and one of the strands that comes up in this story is the idea is that a roving uh, bunch, a, a marauding Parisian gang killed Marie. And where have we heard that before? I think, I think I've even suggested it in these Quebec murderers, right? With the, with the, the 81s, the, the, the Hells Angels. And he immediately puts this to rest as, as a cliche, as not the most probable uh, reason. I won't go into all his very fine reasons why it is improbable but suggests that the more likely outcome was that that Marie was was in fact uh, murdered by w- potentially one of several lovers that she she had and you know i finished this and just thought man michael is right he's he's on to something here here's a guy poe writing in the 1850s and he's spot on man his uh, his deductive reasoning is um, and his practicality is is perfect. So that's my sermon on Edgar Allan Poe. For now, I would uh, I would urge you if you haven't to pick it up. Um, it's really really great reading. Um, based on that, I uh, today it just arrived. I, I bought uh, Michael's um, latest book, uh, Murder in Plain English. Where I, I mean I haven't read it, I, but what I've heard about it is he. He analyzes the writings of murderers and to to see what can be um, 
what can be um, understood from that. I look forward to that. We will have Michael back on the show. He's he's busy promoting um, his this latest book right now, but he expressed his enthusiasm uh, for the podcast, which is it was very encouraging. Um, liked that, and um, certainly wants to. We're going to continue to work on some things. Nothing I'll talk about right now. Um, but we'll have him back uh, when I finish reading Murder in Plain English, and we'll we'll discuss that a little bit. One final loose end that I want to talk about. Michael uh, mentioned, when I asked him what he liked to binge watch, he, um, he mentioned, uh, among several things, uh, forensic files. And, and typically, I don't, I don't watch those shows, but... I happen to be looking on Netflix, and, and sure enough, they've released a new, I think it's about 40 episodes of kind of like the best of forensic files. Um, and um, I kind of thought about it. I said, can I take watching these things, or is it just, or is it just gonna upset me? But I thought, no, I, th I think I can watch this. So I started watching them, um, and they're great. They they discuss all the kind of things we've been discussing here, you know, the. the the difference between um, a souvenir and, and a trophy. Um, the the, the there's a, there's a, in the episodes I've watched. There's a lot of cases where offenders bite victims, which is d disturbing. Um, the different locus of murders and and what that um, involves. Just the sheer uh, technological advances. The things they can do. I. I um, I'm just kind of astounded by how, well, number one, how anyone would be foolish enough to commit a murder in this modern age, because there's, there's so much forensic opportunity for the police to, to, to utilize. Um, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what number two was, but um, yes, but yet on, you know, on the other hand, we do see an awful lot of cases that go unsolved. Uh, the, the other thing that just kind of really, really hit me, um, uh, like a steel bolt to the head was, um, and it's the most obvious thing, but I'm just going to say it. Men are real, real dicks. And... With, with dicks, you can substitute your own word there, because I'd prefer a much stronger word, but kind of want to keep this relatively profane-free, unless I really need to say it. But the exploitation of women for, for men's needs, be it financial or sexual, or, or just plain, without even premeditating, opportunistic is deeply disturbing and I apologize women because you've been on to this for a long time and I've certainly been on to it for a long time but it just really hit home to me um, profoundly how 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 wrong this is and and we got to do something about this uh, this isn't, this isn't right um, so in my own corner, the fight I'm going to fight is there's 20 to 30 unsolved murders in the Quebec region that are cold cases. And I'm going to continue to focus on that. And as we progress through this, I'm going to continue to throw up to you options for what could have happened. There's the biker option. There's the copycat option. There's, there's the premeditated killer op option. There's the blitz option. We'll get to this, blitz killers. And maybe it's a series of serial offenders. And I was kind of taken, a, uh, taken to task on this by a couple of commenters, that, and you know, certainly saying, I was connecting too much. Well, you can connect too much and you can connect too little, right? You can get too focused and kind of miss the trees in the forest, and you can not have any focus at all and just see generalities and not see the details of the picture. Both are true. But let me, let me paint for you a truly chilling prospect. 
So, you don't like my idea of a series of serial offenders operating in the Quebec region at the same time over overlapping in a four or five year period. That, that seems like fantasy to you. Okay. Let me give you the chilling alternative. 20 to 30 one-off murders in a four to five year period in which no one was ever caught. So, I'm going to pause. You think on that for a minute. So I now want to introduce the case of Joanne Dorian. And Joanne disappears just two months prior to the murder of Catherine Hawks. And what's important uh, about that is that Joanne works at the Sacré-Cœur Hospital, which is in the Cartierville area where Catherine Hawks lived. It's just a few blocks from where Catherine, well, I don't want to say a few, I'd say four long blocks from where Catherine Hawks was found murdered. So she works at this hospital, and her commute is to take the Henri Barassa bus home to Laval. She lives in Fabreville, Laval, which is, you go, you go west along Henri Barassa, and then you take a bridge north off the island of Montreal into Laval. So I'm, let me just, I'll just go from my website and I'll, I'll kind of read you the details on uh, Joanne Dorian. Uh, Joanne Dorian disappeared July 9th, 1977. Uh, she um, lived on the island of Laval um, in Fabreville, and she was 17 years of age. Joanne Dorian worked as a medical secretary at Sacré-Cœur Hospital in Cartierville. She left work around 11.45 p.m., uh, the night of her disappearance, um, and took the bus back to Fabreville. According to the bus driver, Dorian got off the bus in Fabreville at approximately 12.30 a.m. at the corner of Boulevard uh, Arthur Sauvé and uh, Saint Rose. And this is the last sighting, the bus driver is the last sighting of Joanne Dorian. Uh, the following morning at 7 a.m., Joanne's parents, who lived at 9th Avenue in Fabreville, noticed that she hadn't come home that evening. Um, so she's missing for a period of approximately a, a month. And then finally, on Thursday, uh, August 11th, 1977, close to 6 p.m., uh, a 12-year-old boy named uh, Martin Fontaine is walking close to the shore of Rivière des Mille, um, and he smells this foul o odor. And he then notices in the bushes this blue plastic bag. He approaches the bag, and about 100 feet from the shore, he sees a foot with a woman's sh shoe in it, and also a hand wearing a bracelet uh, near these trees. And he immediately goes and tells his brother and his father. So Dorian is found off a gravel road just on the edge of, of, of the waterway. It's called uh, Rivière des Milles-Îles, but essentially it's the St. Lawrence River where the St. Lawrence River splits around Montreal, and this would be the north part of it. Um, so she's, she's found off the road um, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue in Fabreville, Laval, approximately eight blocks from where she was last seen at the bus stop and six blocks further away from her home on 9th Avenue. The police arrive at approximately 9.30 or 9.50 p.m. The body's lying under a thicket of trees near the river, and it's in an advanced state of decomposition. Um, in, in Joanne's case, it had it, it was this, this summer. It was hot. Um, 
she had been left in that part of the, if you know Montreal, very swampy, very muddy. A body left there for a month would, um, flies and insects would get to it very, very quickly and it would decompose very quickly. So police observe a skirt, blouse and underwear on the body and the pl blue plastic bag the boy saw, it turns out to be a, a Dominion shopping bag containing papers identifying the body as Joanna Dorian. Also found near the body is the right sleeve of Dorian's blouse, which had been completely torn off and, and blood, bloodied, very bloodied. Back at the location where she left the bus, police find Dorian's eyeliner in the parking lot of a little snack bar named Chateau Laval. So the autopsy is performed on, on, on Dorian, and um, it's observed that she was stabbed several times in the chest and neck area, suffered massive hemorrhaging to the heart and lungs. We, we don't know that if she was raped um, because the, the, the entire vaginal area was completely destroyed by the decomposition. And... So we don't know that she was or wasn't. We also don't even know, we don't know if she may have been strangled to subdue her initially. Um, but because, again, because of the decomposition, we, we do not know that. Now, so that's Dorian. In addition to that, I want to discuss um, another case uh, that happened right around the same time as Dorian Hawks. And that's one we've referred to before, and that's the case of Chantal Tremblay. And I'm going to introduce it and just kind of parking lot the whole thing for now. Um, Chantal's case won't take very long because we, we don't know very much about it. So in the case of Chantal Tremblay, she's, she's a student. She, she lives in Laval. So she lives in the same area that Dorian lives, but at the opposite end. If, if, if uh, Dorian is to the west, uh, Tremblay is living to the east, but both of them very close to this uh, De Mille Ile water uh, passage. So she's a student uh, at a Cégep, a, a pre-college in, in the east end of Montreal on St. Denis Street very close to the region on Saint-Denis, where Lise Amblay lived and was murdered, and very close to the region where uh, Denise Bézenet lived in the East End and disappeared. So she lives with her parents, and it's the, the exact area is Rosemere. This is Tremblay. Approximately 5.30 p.m. on July 29th, 1977. So you see, again, with, with Hawks, Dorian, uh, and, and Tremblay, we are, um, in terms of time, very in close proximity. So she leaves her home, 17 years old, and she gets on a bus. And it's Route 344. She follows uh, the, the road, Grand Côte Boulevard. Uh, and at approximately 6.15 p.m., the bus driver notices Chantal exit the bus at the Henri Barassa metro uh, subway station in Montreal. Now recall, we've already talked about uh, Henri Barassa. That's the route. It's the same route that Dorian was riding a bus. So Chantal was on her way to meet her sister down the metro line at Berry de Montenay. And that, that's in downtown Montreal, again in the East End. She's going to meet her sister, and then they were going to travel together to, to visit, I believe, re its relatives in Quebec City. But Chantal never made it to the Berry de Montenay station. The last time she's seen is just east of Cartierville, uh, along the uh, Henri Barassa line at the Henri Barassa metro station. And it's almost two years later, on April 21st, 1979, Two young boys are walking in a, a wooded area, and this area is just anecdotally owned by the Department of National Defense. 
uh, and it's in Terbonne, and the Terbonne is very near where she lived in the Rosemere area of that east part of Laval. And they discover human bones on a hill. Um, and her clothing is lying about 200 to 300 feet from the remains. And of course, the, the cause of death is, is never stated, um, but the newspapers do say that she was murdered. So curiously, we, we have now this idea of, of, of public transportation coming into play where we have not seen it before. We have Hawks riding a bus, we have Dorian riding a bus, and now we have Tremblay riding a bus, and they're all, they all disappeared at um, approximately the same time and are, are found or had places of origin um, geographically uh, very, very, very similar. And one of the things that's interesting is, you know, it's not only me making this connection. The, the newspapers at the time make a, a connection. Uh, they say um, this, this teenager was also using the bus of the Laval Transit Commission from the Henri Barassa metro station. And that, you know, that um, reference refers to uh, the, the suggestion that Dorian was using the same bus route as Chantal Tremblay. Um, again, we, this is di very, very different from the, the kind of ruse crimes we have where someone is somehow lured into a car. A car. Now we have uh, bus routes and, and the potential of somebody following somebody. It could be somebody following somebody on a bus. Or it could, it could be nothing like that. It could certainly be in the case of Dorian that the bus is just a coincidence. Uh, she gets off the bus. It's a snatch and grab. An altercation happens in, in the, the parking lot of that snack bar. Boom. And, and certainly in, in, um, in Tremblay's case, what is very, very curious is she takes this bus out of Laval along... Henri Barassa to the metro station, and yet she's found all the way back at her place of origin, which is, uh, to my mind, very very curious. Why did we, why do we go that whole route? It doesn't really make sense if if somebody was riding a bus in that case. It seems to suggest a car. I mean, you're not going to get on a bus with a with a dead body and go all all the way back, unless of course. Um, Somehow you convince somebody, you coerce somebody, you, you trick somebody into going back home with you. Seems far-fetched, but anyway, those are, those are some of the options. One of the other things I, I want to mention uh, is at the time, shortly after Dorian is, is found, the, uh, the mother of Sharon Pryor who was murdered just uh, two years uh, previous to this, writes a letter to the Dorian family. And uh, the letter is uh, very curious for a number of reasons, and I'm just going to pull it up here and uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. So this is dated August 16th, 77. So shortly after uh, Joanne Dorian is, is, is found. It says, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dorian family, and this is in English, you do not know me, but I would like to let you know that my thoughts are with you um, through the loss of your lovely daughter, Joanne. I'm writing as a mother who n knows the deep... Uh, uh, hurt and sorrow of losing a teenage daughter in such a brutal manner and the anger that you feel inside. My 16-year-old daughter, Sharon, met the same fate two years ago. Her murderer or murderers have not been caught yet. She was found in Long Gay. I grieve with you now at Joanne's passing and say 
as I'm sure you must always say, why? Sincerely, Sharon Pryor, Point Saint Charles. Uh, and a, 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 a deeply moving uh, letter f from another victim. Uh, and two years later, clearly, uh, the Pryors had no answers uh, for, for the death of their daughter. And we are compounding and adding more and more cases to these horrible tragedies. I do all want to point out to you now is we've, in, in addition to, to adding another two victims to the register, we've now added at least one other police agency, possibly two others. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, Dorian, because the body was found in Laval, we now have the Laval police uh, involved in it. And again, uh, no communication. You'd, the victimology of where somebody disappears in Montreal, in Cartierville, is just as important as the victimology where they were found and the modus operandi of the crime. And yet these, these agencies were not communicating. Cartierville was, was serviced by Station 10 of the MUC police. We've talked about, there's a, there's a documentary on Station 10 we've talked about from the National Film Board of Canada. I've put it on my website. You can go and look at it. It's a good time capsule for that period. And I want to point out, with the Laval police, we have a repetition of, of criminal failures. I'll put it on my website. There's a fantastic photograph of the lead investigator at the scene of the crime holding up the torn, bloody sleeve of Dorian's blouse with his bare hands. Now, I understand they didn't have DNA at that time, but they certainly had fingerprint um, capabilities. There, couldn't have, there could have been a latent print on, on that blouse sleeve that um, was completely negligent in handling it that way. Any, anyone would have known at that time. Um, and this is not uncommon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post another photo on my website. It's, it's of a case from 74, the Debbie Fisher uh, case. Um, it's a classic photo. I've never seen anything like it. It's a Sarté de Quebec officer at the crime scene where, um, where they have recovered a screwdriver from the crime scene. And the officer is holding the screwdriver um, from the metal end with his bare hand and he's handing it through the car window uh, holding the wooden or or the, the plastic end that you would hold it with to the the other investigator so from one hand to the receiving hand of of the other officer where the offender would have held it completely obliterating any potential for fingerprints. I close with a few thoughts since we're getting near near the hour. If we haven't already um, gone over it, there's another case to keep in mind. Um, also near Fabreville. Again, Fabreville is the the district in Laval where Dorian um, was last seen and was was found murder. Um, six weeks earlier, on June 14, 1977. Joanne Dassereau also disappeared from Favreville. And that's all we know. Um, she just disappeared. Now, it, it, it may be that she eventually came home. She was a runaway, something like that. But we don't know that. We just know she disappeared. And then um, to kind of now put up this idea, okay, we, we have these commuter vehicular um, cases, abductions and dumps. And now we have this very urban kind of uh, scenario using public transportation. It seems very different um, in, in some of these, certainly with, with Dorian, with, with Hawks, appears to be a blitz kind of case. 
a blitz attack as opposed to a calculated uh, abduction, although not necessarily so. Uh, uh, Darion's timeline is 30 days missing, so don't hold it. Don't hold too hard and fast to that idea. Could be could be something else. Um, and also don't hold too hard and fast to any of these cases because we're going to add some more and you're going to see that there's impl implications that they they can pivot to different areas. We just don't know. It's good to keep an open mind. But something I'd like to close on um, is, a, is an idea that Michael Arnfield left us with. If you recall, he said in, in cases where strangulation is involved and we've seen strangulation Certainly in all of the, the initial cases we've discussed, not, not Dubay, but Alor, Cameron, Monast, uh, Bézinet, Pryor, Blay. Um, we don't know that Dorian wasn't strangled. We don't know that Tremblay wasn't strang strangled. The, the, the bodies were in too far an advanced state of decomposition. But what Arntfeld, the criminologist, uh, mentions is that when there is strangulation, in 90% of strangulation cases, it is an indicator of serial murder, that the offender often uses strangulation to render the victim initially uh, unconscious, not, not to initially murder them, but to incapacitate them so that they, they can then uh, involve themselves with the victim in some form of sexual deviance. So... With that, that's a lot to chew on this week. I have to go to my daughter's jazz recital. Uh, I will post anything visually interesting that um, may be related to what I discussed today. I'll, I'll post on the Teresa website, um, www.teresalor.com. Uh, if you have comments, suggestions, tips, uh, things you want to contact me about anonymously, that you can reach me at teresalor at gmail.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E -E at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at, um, at Justice Guy, J-U-S-T-U-S. -U uh, Justice, I'm not playing games with that. It's just, I came up with that handle long before I started doing this stuff. It's my mother's maiden name. That's where that came from. It's not, <laughs> it's not trickery or anything. Uh, and then finally, there's, there's a YouTube station. If you go to YouTube and if you search Teresa Lore, it'll pull up um, a lot of visual um, uh, news reports, etc. about um, these cases. Oh, and, and finally, I, I want to mention uh, Poirier en Enquête. That's the Quebec French language uh, investigative journalism, journalism show that is currently in its second season. They did a profile a couple of weeks ago on Jean Darien, um, which is very helpful to you. If, if you're in Canada, I think you can access that. And even if you're not, if you have one of those tools that can get around IP, uh, IP addresses, you can probably access it as well. Um, so I'll, I'll post a link to the Poirier Enquête episode as well. So, so far, um, if you're keeping score, that's three of the cases I've profiled that uh, Claude uh, Poirier has also profiled um, uh, cinematically, uh, Theresa Lor, Helen Monast, and uh, Joanne Dorian, which is very, very, very helpful for him to be, um, for they to be doing this Historia TV in Canada. Uh, helps get the word out um, in Quebec in the French language. So that's all for this week. Um, Thank you for joining me and have a great, great evening. Bye-bye.